Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer. Uh, I have to pre-record this and upload it instead of using a live feed of any kind because for some reason YouTube is not letting me create a live video tonight. Uh, so, you won't be able to tell the difference. Let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. The King ascends to heaven. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Our New Testament reading today is from Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea, than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what is our duty. On the way to Jerusalem he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village he was met by ten lepers who stood at, his, at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. It's interesting the word foreigner that Jesus uses that uh, Luke records in his gospel is only used in one other place, and it's not in Scripture. It was actually inscribed above the uh, court of the Gentiles at the entrance to the temple. It said, No foreigners. Uh, because if a, a non-Jew went past that point, they uh, would be uh, killed for entering uh, that holy place. So had this leper gotten all the way to the temple to show himself to the priest, he would have seen that sign and saw he was not welcome. Of course, Gentiles are welcome in the presence of the Lord now, in the presence of Christ himself. So he went back to where God truly was for him. And as promised, our Book of Concord reading tonight is Article 2 of the Large Catechism. This is my favorite part of the Large Catechism, particularly Articles 2 and 3 of the Creed. Uh, but we will begin Article 1 of the Apostles' Creed. 
So Article 2 of the Large Catechism, beginning in paragraph 1. So far we have heard the first part of Christian doctrine. We have seen all that God wants us to do or not to do. Now there properly follows the creed, which sets forth to us everything that we must expect and receive from God. To state it quite briefly, the creed teaches us to know him fully, Ephesians 3.19. This is intended to help us do what we ought to do according to the Ten Commandments. For, as said above, the Ten Commandments are set so high that all human ability is far too feeble and weak to help them. Therefore, it is just as necessary to learn this part of Christian doctrine as to learn the former. Then we may know how to attain when, what they command, both where and how to receive such power. For if we could, by our own powers, keep the Ten Commandments as they should be kept, we would need nothing further, neither the creed nor the Lord's Prayer. But before we explain this advantage and necessity of the creed, it is enough at first for the simple-minded to learn to comprehend and understand the creed itself. In the first place, the creed has, until now, been divided into twelve articles. Yet, if all the doctrinal points that are written in the scriptures and that belong to the creed were to be distinctly set forth, there would be far more articles. They could not all be clearly expressed in so few words. But to make the creed most easily and clearly understood as it is to be taught to children, we shall briefly sum up the entire creed in three chief articles according to the three persons in the Godhead, Colossians 2.9. Everything that we believe is related to these three persons, so the first article about God the Father explains creation, the second article about the Son explains redemption, and the third about the Holy Spirit explains sanctification. We present them as though the creed were briefly summarized in so many words, I believe in God the Father who has created me. I believe in God the Son who has redeemed me. I believe in the Holy Spirit who sanctifies me. One God and one faith, but three persons. Therefore, three articles or confessions. Let us go over the words briefly. That was the introduction to the creed. Uh, the uh, tradition he talks about, about the creed being divided into 12 articles. Tradition held that each of the 12 apostles wrote one sentence of the creed. There's 12 sentences. So they were divided by those 12 sentences, and one sentence each was attributed to one of the apostles, which is which I have no idea. Uh, I'm not even entirely sure how that tradition got started. Uh, there's no basis in history for it whatsoever. Article 1. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. This shows and sets forth most briefly what is God the Father's essence, will, activity, and work. The Ten Commandments have taught that we are to have not more than one God, Deuteronomy 6.4. So it might be asked, what kind of person is God? What does he do? How can we praise or show and describe him that he may be known? Now, that is taught in this in the following article, so the creed is nothing other than the answer and confession of Christians arranged with respect to the first commandment. It is as if you were to ask a little child, my dear, what sort of a God do you have? What do you know about him? The child could say, this is my God, first the Father who created heaven and earth. Besides this one only, I regard nothing else as God, for there is no one else who could create heaven and earth. But for the learned and those who are somewhat advanced, these three articles may all be expanded and divided into as many parts as there are words. But now, for young scholars, let it suffice to make the most necessary points, as we have said, that this first article refers to the creation. We emphasize the words, creator of heaven and earth. But what is the force of this, or what do you mean by these words? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Answer. This is what I mean and believe that I am God's creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 I mean that he has given and constantly preserves, Psalm 36.6, for me, my body, soul, and life, my members great and small, all my senses, reason, and understanding, and so on. He gives me food and drink, clothing and support, wife and children, domestic servants, house and home, and more. Besides, he causes all created things to serve for the uses and necessities of life. These include the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens, day and night, air, fire, water, earth, and whatever it bears and produces. They include birds and fish, beasts, grain, and all kinds of produce. Psalm 104. They also include whatever else there is for bodily and temporal goods, like good government, peace, and security. So we learn from this article that none of us owns for himself, nor can preserve his life, nor anything that is here listed or can be listed. This is true no matter how small and unimportant a thing it might be. 
for all is included in the word creator. And that is where we will end uh, for tonight. That's the first half of Article 1 as well as the introduction. It's interesting to look at that list he gives us of this is what I mean and believe that I am God's creature, that he has given me uh, food, drink, clothing, support, wife, children, domestic servants, and all sorts of things. Uh, whatever else there is for body and temporal goods, like good government, peace, and security. If you look through these lists, you'll kind of see the progression of the prayer of the church on Sunday morning. You'll see this kind of pattern of the order things go in. Uh, some switch things around a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, they, they, they kind of follow this pattern where they go from uh, big abstract things and then work their way to uh, specific things. Uh, so that pattern is kind of reflected a little bit here in what Luther writes in the Catechism. Okay, so on tomorrow evening, we will finish Article 1 of the Creed. And speaking of the Creed, we confess it now along with the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride, your holy vineyard is trampled, and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood. And let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stray far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O Eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward you, uh, toward one another, to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, as your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens, so may we also ascend in heart and mind and continually dwell there with him, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. I thank you, dearest Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, that you have worked in us a constant desire for your word, and thus both the desire and performance according to your good pleasure. Now we see the truth of what the Spirit said through David, when your word is manifested, it gives joy and makes wise the simple. Seal in us, therefore, all the words of prophecy in this book, and take not the word of truth out of our mouths, for we hope in your judgments. It is ever our treasure and sweeter than honey to our mouths. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Yea, preserve unto us your word, for it is the joy and comfort of our hearts. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong 
and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a good evening. Good night.